Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Unheard Club here in the heart of Westminster. Um, what we're doing today is a bit different. We haven't actually done a full-on debate before, but it feels like this issue is one that really does need to be talked about. Um, it matters, and there is somewhat of an atmosphere of taboo around it. If you have uh, what are considered to be the wrong opinions, um, you are perhaps considered to be a bad person or you're, you're shut down in the, the public debate somewhat. We've seen that with recent issues becoming a bit more of a trend. And here at Unheard, we don't like it. We think we should be able to speak freely. And important matters of policy should be rigorously debated. So that is what we are here to do. Um, the Ukraine debate is the topic. We do actually have a motion which had to be agreed with our four star speakers, a bit like a kind of communique after a uh, summit with many powerful actors. Uh, the West should give more military support to Ukraine, is the motion. Uh, more military support to Ukraine. Um, and what I thought we'd do just before I introduce our speakers is we can actually take a vote on it. Uh, so we're going to try and do this at the beginning and the end. Don't know how well it's going to work, but we have people in the room. We also have people online. And we have a little voting tool that you can either access by scanning these little QR codes that are about the place. Don't worry, we're not recording your information or in any way attached to the Chinese government. Um, and if you are online, there should be a link, a posted comment that's kept at the top of the live stream with the link to the poll. So the question is, the West should give more military support to Ukraine. Agree or disagree? So if you're in the room, we could take a IRL vote. And I will do my best to, to roughly count it, because then you don't have to do the fiddly QR code. If you're online, you have to do the QR code. So all those who agree that the West should give more military support to Ukraine, please raise your hands. OK. I'm a minority. Got to around yeah, 29 but, but still, there in my speed count. The All those who disagree, the, the, polls have, right? the West should Makes not give more military support to Ukraine. I think they know where you're at, Peter. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> if I'm voting, I'm voting. <laughs> I made that 24. <laughs> Roughly speaking, we then have a most interestingly divided audience uh, in the room. Um, online, we have a more decidedly uh, oppositional audience to this motion, where at the start of the debate, 62% of people seem to be against it, 37 in favor. So we'll see if that changes by the end. Um, our panelists are debaters, I should say, today. Um, Edward Lucas, um, an esteemed no journalist and security expert, someone who has been uh, understanding these things for decades, will be proposing the motion first, um, then followed by Peter Hitchens, um, who will be opposing the motion. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Peter is a, also a very esteemed journalist. Um, it will then go back to Constantine Kissin, who, as well as being a comedian and a writer and uh, someone who runs a wonderful YouTube channel called Trigonometry, has risen in recent months to be something of an expert and a, and a vocal um, sort of member of the debate here um, uh, on the topic of Ukraine. So it'd be really interesting to see what he has to say. And Thomas Fatsy, fresh off the plane from Rome, who I'm delighted to say is an unheard columnist and has very eloquent views that I look forward to hearing tonight. So we have great panelists. Final word before I let them get on with it. Please, members of the debating teams, can we have, first of all, a presumption of good faith in the other parties? I think that's kind of a principle we like, which is let's not say that if that someone, let's just presume people mean what they say. And the other thing to, I would urge you, is let's try not to get lost in the minutiae of the motion, because it's kind of boring for everyone else. We know what the question is here. The West has rallied to the support of Ukraine in reaction to this uh, invasion by Russia. We are currently on a trajectory of increasing support most recently, it was tanks. Now the discussion is, uh, is fighter jets. Is that virtuous, necessary, and must be back to the hilt? 
or does it make you anxious and should we, putting, should we be putting the brakes on? That's the question fundamentally and let's try to get to the heart of it. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let me give the stage to Edward Lucas to propose the motion. Thanks very much indeed. It's a pleasure to be here. I, ha I have difficulty with the idea that this, this subject is taboo, as I've debated it on several occasions with, um, not in, indeed with Peter himself, um, only a, a, the, a few, few weeks ago. And I think Peter's going to argue um, two things which I strongly agree with. Um, war is bad, and <laughs> this war is our fault. And that's absolutely true. Um, he'll also say that Russia was provoked. Um, by the West, we've needlessly made an enemy of Russia. Russia um, is an empire, has imperial um, claims to uh, cordon sanitaire around it, and that's OK because the EU is an empire as well, or the continuation of Germany by other means, as Peter so memorably put it. <laughs> um, but where I, 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 I disagree, because we had, um, far from provoking Russia, uh, we were warned all through the 1990s that... The Soviet Empire might have gone, but the Russian Empire had not. And those warnings came not just from Ukrainians, but from Estonians and Latvians and Lithuanians and Poles and many others. And we ignored and patronised and belittled um, the people giving us those warnings because we were greedy. We were making a huge amount of m money out of Russia and we didn't want to see um, the problem that was developing there. And the result of that is that hundreds of thousands of people are dead or maimed or traumatised and we face a trillion dollar bill for the reconstruction of Ukraine and it's not over yet. Ukraine can win this. Ukraine has shown, it's defied expectations. They've shown that they really believe in the same things that we believe in, freedom, justice, liberty, things they didn't have in full. I absolutely agree. Peter will tell you, no doubt, that Ukraine was a very corrupt country. It certainly was. Corruption not limited to Ukraine, one might almost say, looking at some other places closer to home, like across the road. <laughs> um, but Ukraine's <laughs> aspirations are our aspirations. And they are laying down their lives for them. And they're also for our own freedom. Because if Russia wins this war, Europe is incomparably more dangerous. Peter will tell you um, that NATO should have wound up in 1991. I profoundly disagree. It's the most successful military alliance in history. And although it was designed to deal with the Soviet Union, it is also there for the territorial defence of countries which are menaced by Russia. If you don't believe it, just look back at the last 15, 20 years at what Russia has tried to do to the Baltic states, not least the Zapad 09 military exercises, which rehearsed the occupation and invasion of the Baltic states and finished up with a dummy nuclear strike on Warsaw. Ukraine can win this war, but as we said during the Second World War, you have to give them the tools to finish the job. If we had done for Ukraine a year ago what we're already doing now, there would be no war. If we'd let Ukraine into NATO in 2008, there would be no war. This war is fundamentally the result of Russian overconfidence and Western weakness. The longer we dither, whether we dither over artillery or over tanks or over fighter planes or anything else, the longer the war will go on and the greater the risk. So let us give the Ukrainians the tools to finish the job. They're not just fighting for their freedom, they're fighting for ours as well. Thank you. Well, good evening <clears throat> and thank you, Edward, for making so many of my points for me and saving me <laughs> so much time as a result. So let me first of all ask a very simple question. What on earth are we all doing here anyway? Why do we care about Ukraine? I care about Ukraine for two principal reasons. One, that I'm a Christian who strongly believes that war is hell and who does not like to see contented human beings turned into corpses and refugees and wishes it to cease. The second is that I'm a British patriot who sees war on the continent of Europe and worries uh, why we are engaged in this enterprise and where it might end for us and is filled with fear for the possible outcome. So I'm driven by two very strong reasons for caring about this, which I've no doubt people in this room share in their own different ways. It is a vitally important subject, almost certainly the most important debate this country has had since the invasion of Iraq in 2003, another mistaken attempt to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, by idealists to reform the world with military force. I'm not going to go into a lengthy disquisition. I am going to say, however, that it is absolutely futile, as has uh, been many times said, that anyone who doesn't know what happened before he was born will be forever a child. Anyone who doesn't really know what happened in Ukraine before, uh, before a year ago, before 2022, is likewise a child in these matters. 
And I find it distressing that so many people profess uh, passion about this subject without the necessary knowledge. Uh, when someone wants to be totally dismissive about anything you say, what he says is, I neither know nor care about what you think. Well, I, I'm afraid if you want to care about Ukraine, you have to know. And you have to know, therefore, the history of the long, long mistaken policy followed by particularly the United States uh, since the early 1990s uh, against the advice of some of the cleverest and most experienced people in the world, notably George Kennan, the architect of our victory in the Cold War, who came out of retirement in the 1990s to warn desperately against NATO expansion, saying not merely that it would lead to tension, but that it would be a slap in the face for those Democrats in Russia who'd finally uh, regained power after, uh, after 70 years of Bolshevik tyranny. And also, of course, that it would strengthen the power of the of, of, of reactionary nationalists in Russia, which it demonstrably had. And then uh, I would turn to, the, to such people as Yegor Gaidar, the very kind of Russian everybody in this room claims to like. Yegor Gaidar, a liberal democratic politician, the, the absolute antithesis of Vladimir Putin, a man who went in desperation to his friends in NATO and said, will you please try and stop your, all your nations expanding NATO eastwards? It is disastrous. It will do nothing but strengthen the bad people in Russia and lead to war. These were things which were happening when most of you, I'm sorry to say, weren't looking, and I was. And that is why I find myself in this position of being, and it won't happen tonight because I know you're all far too survived, being called the slanderous things such as a Putin apologist, a war crimes denier, and all the other rubbish that gets turned against anybody who thinks differently against this. There is, I'm sorry to say, an attempt to create a unanimous opinion on this matter that we are at war with East Asia and therefore we must all be permanently lined up with every policy which goes with that. That is always a mistake. From Suez to Vietnam to Iraq to Afghanistan, there has always been another opinion. And the shocking thing to me is that in this country for the past year, only one opinion has effectively been heard outside of very few small rooms in which Edward and I have grappled with the subject. You won't hear it on the BBC. You won't see it in most newspapers apart from my own. And it is absolutely shocking that such a major issue should not have been debated. So congratulations on you all for coming here tonight to listen to some arguments at last. Well, hello, everybody. Um, first of all, I, great speech by Peter, in which he absolutely did not address the motion, which is should we give more support to Ukraine or not. He talked oh, I'll to, come to that. Uh, I'm sure you will. Um, <laughs> now, uh, let's first of all talk about what Vladimir Putin has said about this war. I think that might be a good place to start. Two days ago, he gave a speech, or was it yesterday? I can't remember now, uh, in which he explained that Ukraine is historic Russian land that is now currently called Ukraine as a temporary misunderstanding and also explained, and he's, this is a point he's repeated in many of his speeches, and also explained that what, the reason that Russia is so frustrated with what's happening is that the, Amer the evil uh, capitalist pig dogs from America are trying to remake the post-World War II order. Now, if you think back to history, what is the post-World post War II order? It is the subjugation of the entirety of Central and Eastern Europe by the Soviet Union. Uh, and if that is what we want to allow to happen again, uh, we can. Uh, I don't think that is in the interest of the people of those territories, nor indeed uh, the West more broadly. Um, so, but also, let me ask you a question. If you do not support uh, giving Ukraine more support, uh, how many of you supported never, ever, any point providing support to Ukraine just by a show of hands? I'm just curious, and I, I will not judge you for this. <laughs> Arm support. Arm support, military support. How many of you supported never giving them anything? Right, about four of you. So there's quite a lot of people in this room who supported giving them some support, but do not support continuing to support them. So what is the point of providing support to Ukraine if you're only going to support them so they get sl slaughtered slightly slower or so they lose their country slightly slower? Now, if you believe we shouldn't have given them any support at all, that's a position I respect. That is absolutely fine. But if we are to support them, we must support them in defending their country. And I resent very much the, the argument that I've heard repeatedly made here, which is that, you know, if you support uh, giving Ukraine military supplies and so on, that means you're going out for all-out victory over Russia, which, of course, is ridiculous because, first of all, that's impossible. Nuclear countries cannot lose wars. Uh, but if we are <coughs> to support Ukraine, what we need to do, and I've said this from day one, uh, is we need to allow them to put up a good fight and then be left with uh, whatever is the end result of that process. Now, 
And there are actually plenty of precedents for this. For example, the winter war in which my grandfather, great-grandfather fought on, on the Russian side. That is what happened. Uh, the Finns were able to inflict huge casualties on the Russians. And as a result, they retained their sovereignty and independence. When the Soviet leadership under Joseph Stalin had prepared a cadre of uh, pro-Soviet communists who would have taken over the entire country, which is exactly what Vladimir Putin wanted to do with Ukraine, having prepared Viktor Medvedchuk to take over the moment Ukraine folded. Uh, so what we are dealing with here is a situation in which uh, people go, well, we must have peace. Well, how do you have peace between two countries that want to continue fighting? That is the situation we're in now. And if we offered support to Ukraine initially, we have an opportunity and a responsibility and a duty, in my view, to see it through. Now, uh, I don't expect everybody to agree with me on this point, uh, which is why I've always made the point uh, from the very beginning when Freddie interviewed me the day after the invasion. Uh, that what we must do depends very much on the outcome we wish to achieve. What, what is it that we want? What is it that we want? If you want Ukraine to collapse and for Russia to be emboldened by the fact that it's able to expand westwards, then don't give Ukraine any support. That's fine. That's a position I respect. But you have to calibrate your policy based on the outcomes you're trying to achieve. And uh, I'm interested in this repeated mention of Iraq. Uh, because I oppose the invasion of Ukraine by Russia for the very same reason I oppose the invasion of Iraq uh, by the United States and the United Kingdom, because big b bullying empires shouldn't be allowed to carry on with this sort of behavior. I've overrun. I'm sure we'll have plenty of points to make later. Thank you. Thomas. All right. Okay. So, um, yes, I'm very much opposed to the motion. Uh, but first, I'd like to ask everyone to resist the temptation of framing this debate as one of pro-Ukraine versus anti-Ukraine, as this issue tends to be framed in the public arena, whereby those in favor of continuing uh, to pour weapons into Ukraine and continuing the war are designated or described as pro-Ukraine, while those that are in favor of de-escalation and a diplomatic solution to the conflict are described as enemies of Ukraine or pro-Putin. I reject this simplistic Hollywood-esque <coughs> narrative because it would mean believing that the US and NATO only have the best interest of Ukraine and the Ukrainians at heart, that they're only there to defend freedom and democracy against Russian authoritarianism. Uh, it would mean believing that uh, the US has been fanning the flames of war and meddling in Ukrainian affairs for more than a decade, including contributing to the violent overthrow of the country's democratically elected president in 2014, which plunged the country into an eight-year-long bloody civil war, only because it had the best interest of Ukraine at heart. It would mean believing that the US and NATO subsequently sabotaged every attempt to reach a peace agreement to that civil war, as they themselves have, have admitted, only because they had the best interest, the best long-term interest of Ukraine at heart. It would mean that they stoked anti-Russian nationalism in Ukraine and supported extremist neo-Nazi groups and, and, and poured weapons in and were pouring weapons in well before 2022 because they had the best interest of Ukraine at heart. It would mean that over the past year, they have continued to sabotage any attempt by third countries to broker a peace deal, uh, for example, Turkey, Israel, uh, and have instead pushed for continuous escalation because they had the best interest of Ukraine at heart. And that today they say that the war must go on for as long as it takes, possibly years, as Biden said, only because they have the best interest of Ukraine at heart. And while I don't believe that for a second, um, I think it's complete hogwash. I think they don't give a damn about Ukraine and the Ukrainians. I think they've been using Ukraine as pawns in their geopolitical schemes before the, the conflict, and they're using them now as cannon fodder in their proxy war against Russia, just like Russia is doing, to mount a challenge to the West, as has already been said. But the US and NATO couldn't care less about Ukraine, and I think the past year has showed it. What has the Ukraine must win at all costs strategy achieved? a country in ruin, massive loss of life, an energy crisis that has plunged millions of Europeans into poverty as well, that is deindustrializing Europe, that has pushed us to the brink of a direct NATO-Russia confrontation, which would obviously have devastating consequences. And all for what? For a war that cannot be won, as anyone in US and policy defense circles knows fully well. As Fiona Hill, the former senior director for Europe of the US National Security Council, told you, Freddie, just a few days ago. As the ultra hawkish Rand Corporation think tank admits in a recent report. And ultimately, I think this is the real tragedy of this, that this war will end in the only way it can end, barring catastrophic scenarios, 
with a peace deal more or less along the same lines as the one that could have been brokered a year ago, that could potentially have avoided the war. And so I think there's absolutely no justification for continuing military support, for continuing the war, a war that is benefiting only the US and Western military industrial complex more in general. It's benefiting US corporate financial interests, which are already divvying up Ukraine for the post-war so-called reconstruction. Companies like BlackRock, big agribiz companies that are already uh, that they already have plans as to how they will divide Ukrainian resources among themselves. But this war certainly is not benefiting Ukraine, and that's why I stand with millions of Europeans that want peace, uh, and that of course means forcing the two parties at, down at the negotiating table. This is something that millions of Europeans want, and they're not having their voices heard, and I think they deserve to have their voices heard after a year of disastrous war. Thank you. We are going to open a window or two, by the way, because it's getting quite warm in here. Um, let me ask you guys to, to come in, whichever prefers. Yeah, so I, can I just have hands up? How many Ukrainians are in the room? We have any Ukrainians at all? So half. Finally, half. Yeah. So I, th I think the, 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 what, what I find difficult about this discussion that it's all about. NATO expansion and the, the West and using Ukrainians as proxies, the Ukrainians are the ones who are actually fighting this war. And they are fighting it with, against what initially were overwhelming odds um, with immense bravery and resilience. Um, this is not some kind of... It's not like it was in, in Afghanistan or somewhere like that, where you had a genuine conflict in the country and possibly even the Western-backed... Um, people in Afghanistan may be, may, may be in the, the minority, certainly towards... So, toward... so you don't think it's a proxy war? It's not a proxy. I mean, to talk about a proxy war shows contempt mm. for the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians have agency. They want what we've got. They want to be able to have discussions like this. They want to have the liberty, the legality, the dignity, the things that they associate with, the, um, the, with the, what they call the Euro-Atlantic um, orientation of European mm. Union. Um, membership in the, in, in, in the first instance. And I think we should respect that. It's, it's not fair on them to say, oh, you're just misguided, you're just tools of the military-industrial complex. And I have one other point to make on, on NATO. <clears throat> just look, look back as recently as 2002, and you have Vladimir Putin turning up to the NATO-Russia Council in Rome and giving a speech, which I could quote at length, though I won't because it's quite long, of treacly um, gratitude and support for Russia's new partnership with NATO. And this was after NATO had brought in Poland, uh, the Czech Republic and Hungary, and when NATO was, um, had already agreed in principle to bring in um, the Baltic states and, and Slovakia and, 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 and Romania and the others. So this idea that, that NATO expansion is the original sin, which has kind of cursed the whole of post-1991 Europe, is absolutely ahistorical. Relations between Russia and NATO were excellent until Putin decided they were not going to be excellent anymore. And the reason he decided they were not going to be excellent was he wanted to instrumentalise xenophobia um, for his own domestic political reasons. OK, thank you, Edward. Um, Peter Hitchens, the, the, what say you to that? The, the American presence is idealistic and na the NATO expansion story is... Well, I'll, I'll try to take these points, uh, but I'll start with the NATO one and work backwards. Uh, NATO, as, the, uh, as Professor Richard Sackler has said in his, his excellent book, Frontline Ukraine, which anybody should read who wants to be interest, who's interested in the subject, says that NATO's expansion has created in time the very fears which it claims to be, uh, to, to be protecting against. And that has been the problem. Uh, the expansion of NATO has created a tension which n now provides an argument for expanding NATO. I'm interested to hear Edward discussing the attitude of Russia towards NATO expansion earlier. It's quite obvious from, from, from everything everybody has said from, from Yeltsin onwards uh, that Russia was opposed to NATO expansion from the, fr from the very beginning, but it did, it did put up with NATO expansion over a long period when it could have made trouble over it and didn't. And this seems to me to suggest that the argument about the, the great Russian threat to the countries which have joined NATO is overdone by Edward, to put it, to put it mildly. I was in, uh, in, in Vilnius in 1991, the night the KGB went mad and staged two massacres just before the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I have particular interest in the fate of the Baltic states. And what I noticed was that after they left the, the Soviet Union, 
and were given their independence. There were many, many years before they joined NATO when they were not threatened with invasion. I'm not, I, no, hang on, you, you had your go, and I, I'm, I'm making these points. It is complicated. Russia's, Russia's alarm about NATO actually went into top gear in 2008 for a very simple reason, which was George W. Bush, that master of diplomacy, the man who gave us the Iraq war, forced NATO into making a declaration that Ukraine would be invited to join in 2008. That was the point at which this war became almost certainly inevitable and was an act of plain aggression, especially since it followed Putin's 2007 speech in Munich, in which he said, what is this alliance directed against? What is it that you are doing? Probably the, the, the loudest peaceful diplomatic warning that he was ever going to make. The response by George W. Bush, the most aggressive statement he ever made. An extraordinary piece of behavior. Now, it, 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 the, these things have to be borne in mind. And then Edwards, it, Edwards refers to Ukrainians. There are more, there's more than one kind of Ukrainians. Since 2014, when all those people who say they, they really want Ukraine to have agency, happily watched as Ukraine's elected president was overthrown in an armed putsch uh, containing quite large numbers of extremely unpleasant people, quite unconstitutionally, and did nothing about it and indeed made excuses for it. How you can say that you're in favor of Ukrainian agency, I don't know. Since then, millions of Ukrainians, uh, particularly uh, Russian-speaking and Russian-oriented Ukrainians in the East, have been entirely excluded from Ukrainian democratic politics Man. and have okay. had no say in it whatever, no agency, as you would put it. There are more, there's more than one kind of Ukrainian, Edward, and I think oh, you have man. to remind yourself of that. We have one me. kind of Ukrainian right here. Well, uh, most of my Ukrainian family are Russian speakers in Ukraine. They all support Ukraine defending itself. None of them are pro-Russian in the sense that they want pieces of their country to be bitten off over time. This... Uh, alternative history, to put it very kindly, uh, that we've just heard from both speakers. Uh, the idea that uh, President Yanukovych was overthrown in a coup uh, is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Let me remind people what actually happened. May I? Yeah, um, I do. What actually happened was uh, President Yanukovych, on his election, promised to join a trade treaty with the European Union. And when he refused to do so, and instead under pressure from Vladimir Putin, uh, chose not to do that and to instead promise to sign a treaty with Russia, uh, a small number of students went out into the streets of Kiev to protest against this. On the instructions of Vladimir Putin passed down to President Yanukovych, those students were brutalized by the riot police. And the result of that was that more protesters came out to protest against this. And this whole thing escalated to the point where people were now protesting not about the non-signing the treaty, but about the fact that the, the people in power were using Russian tactics against their own citizens. It was a popular overthrow of a president who'd overstepped what people perceived as his authority in relation to how he treated people. Now, the point but, but on a point of information, Peter, I I, 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 no, I know you haven't, I, but you virtually, let's, let's virtually, let's let's you, no, he's virtually he's, accused me of speaking untruths. Peter, can, can I, I finish and, and what I, I'm saying? I, I think what the, 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 the needs to be Freddy, an intervention this? before Peter, this goes we, any further. Yeah, I can, but if if so, then people will know that a point has been suppressed. You have you have a chance. Uh, so the, the other point I was going to make is Edward is absolutely right because I think the one uh, group of people that hadn't been mentioned prior to your intervention in this conversation are Ukrainians who, who overwhelmingly support what President Zelensky is doing, who overwhelmingly support by 90 plus percent the defense of their country, who are overwhelmingly grateful to the West for providing weapons and finance and support and help to the refugees. And when I speak to people in Ukraine, the first thing they say is make sure you tell people in England, and they call it England, I'm afraid, how <laughs> grateful we are here. So I, I think we shouldn't ignore the fact that when we talk about the Americans using the poor Ukrainians, the Ukrainians themselves want help. They're the ones that are asking for it. And so this idea that the evil Americans have brainwashed uh, poor agency, Leslie Ukrainians, to, 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 to be fighting this war is complete hogwash. So just before we, we come back, yeah. so on this, this NATO thing, which apparently is so central to the other mm. side, you just reject that entirely? Do you no, think there were missteps by the West? Of course. What's your view of that? Well, I, I think the, the confrontation between NATO and Russia is entirely inevitable. If Vladimir Putin believes that uh, the entirety of Eastern and Central Europe should be subjugated and controlled by Russia... And by the way, uh, my dad and I have a fantastic relationship. The one thing we disagree about is this war. My father was a junior minister in Boris Yeltsin's government, and his job in the Ministry of Foreign Relations with former Soviet Union countries was to keep those countries 
under the thumb of Russia, economically, politically, militarily. This is what Russia does. This is what Russia always does. And this notion that, you know, the reason the, the nationalist uh, uh, elements came to power in Russia in response to NATO, uh, and that's why we don't have democracy. The first mention of Russia in the history books is 882. In the entire period since 882 to the present day, Russia has never had a single democratic transition of power. You think that's NATO's fault? It's not true. Okay. What so do you mean it's not true? It's not true. The, the, the election of the Constituent Assembly in, in, in 1917 was, 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 was one of the biggest and most successful democratic elections, particularly conducted yeah. in wartime, ever made by any country, which was then destroyed by the Bolsheviks at the point of a bayonet. But there's no question at all. It so it didn't, I, I, it's not a question of how long it lost. Yeah. It happened. My point is we didn't have any of, democracy. Wiped out of history because people don't know any Russian history. Um, sorry about this, but I mean, I, but you said which countries was it that your father was responsible for keeping under Russia's thumb? The Baltic states and other former states. In, in which countries. years? Uh, he would have been in the Yeltsin government, so probably early 90s. Not a very good job then. No, it wasn't. <laughs> because they objected, because these countries didn't want to be part of the new Russian Empire. No. And I, 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 know, I do want Peter to be able to make his, make, make, make his point on, on, on the Yanukovych era, and I, I worry we're looking, spending too much time. Mm. Looking, looking backwards. Well, you certainly but, don't want us to talk about Yanukovych. Well, I love talking about Yanukovych. Yeah, let's, do Yanukovych let's do it then, because I'm still waiting to have my report. Okay, why don't you, you make your point, then I'll make mine. Okay. Well, yeah, it's a simple, you move on no, but it's a simple point it. I want to ask Konstantin. Mm. Do, do, does he believe that, um, that, that Yanukovych was, was fairly elected as president of, of, of Ukraine? Yeah. Right. So does he believe that, is, that, that those who oppose him, whatever his story about why they opposed him is, is said, does he believe that those who opposed him should not have removed him democratically? If or do you actually believe that if you don't like the way democ democracy is going, yeah, that you're free to use away. violence he against democratic away. leaders? He ran away. Well, if I may respond, uh, if Rishi Sunak starts to gun down protesters in the streets of but London... That's not, that's not what happened. That is what happened. No, it's the protesters started shooting very early on as well. No, no, the very protesters it's were it's armed very early on. They started disputed. shooting at security armed. forces. And uh, most likely what was US State was, Department support as a lot of US officials have said. a gradual increase in the use of state power against peaceful protesters. That's, that then escalated. That said, it's a January 6th kind of it event. It ended up You've with got a Democratic president elected of by millions of people. Hundreds, and hundreds of unarmed of armed citizens some, were not shot on January the 6th. citizens that well, deposed a democratically elected president. It's January 6th. You yeah. think so. Sorry, there is a vital point about this. How can you justify that when you talk about agency when you have a president that was democratically elected? Sorry, it's constitutional law. It's vital. To, to the to, I was asked the freedom. question, I still have an answer. That's why okay. I have my arm up. Gentlemen, can we just try and restore okay. some... Can you chair I, this, please? I, I would like Thomas to come in next, please, because he well, hasn't had a chance on to the, say... And we can't... On the question of... You could, everything no one is denying, denying Ukrainian agency. The two things don't exclude each other. The, the Ukrainians can have... Agent, of course they have agency, of course they have their own objectives they want to reach in the war. This doesn't exclude the fact that the US and NATO are most likely exploiting their desires for their own purposes, arguably leading them and actually fanning the flames of war. I mean, we don't, we, do we really know? I mean, we know that from Turkey, from the former Israeli MP, that, you know, uh, an agreement was close to, uh, to, to, to be reached, you know, with both parties agreeing in, on general terms on what a, a peace deal could have looked like, and then the U.S. came in and killed the agreement. And so the idea that we're just supporting Ukraine because the Ukrainian leadership is asking us to do, to do that, I mean, I think the idea that the, the Ukrainian you know, tail is wagging the American dog. I don't believe that. I think it's much more likely that it's the other way around, that the U.S. from day one, and in fact, you know, even before Russia's invasion, have been, you know, pushing the Ukrainian leadership for a confrontation with, um, with Russia, which is also why I think they've tried to kill every peace deal that the Ukrainian leadership itself mm. has tried to broker. I mean, they, they sat down at the table. So clearly there was a general interest in reaching an agreement. And we know that once it was the UK, once it was Johnson, another time it was the US, they come in and they kill whatever deal happens to be on the table. I mean, we've got even the former Israeli MP, MP saying that. I don't think Pierre saying that. One I don't have, think he's a, a, a Putin student. Have you ever been to Ukraine? I think that's completely beyond the point. No, I just asked you. It's, 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 it's completely beyond the point. It's not. It's I'm a European that is threatened by the, the, the risk of a nuclear conflict just with my truth, countries. Then. And the fact that Ukrainians, that the Ukrainian leadership so wants war, and maybe the Ukrainians do agree that you know it's it's, okay. they are justified in going. You know, the, Thomas, the, that the complete was, destruction of Ukraine and the death question. of hundreds well, of thousands of Ukrainians think, is justified so, in the name I of this war. But the Western leaders don't. They have an obligation to Western citizens before they have an obligation. 
solution a danger. to Ukrainian citizens. That's a danger that we spend too long looking at the past. I know, the, no, the past is crucial. No, I, I know, but we, but, we, but we can we I just a make, make a couple of a couple of points, can please? I, uh, the first of the ones to reassure Edward. Not merely have I been to Ukraine. I used to I say I used to take holidays. In I know Ukraine. you did. I'm asking this. I, I, I once hired a Soviet Navy whale in Ukraine. I know that I'll make up for his life. Please don't do the wall of sound. It's completely on point. You will have you will have opportunities. I've been subjected to one. You will have opportunities. I, I would like us to turn, because I know we could argue for hours about how we got here. <clears throat> Let us now focus on the last 12 months and on the fact that whatever the rights and wrongs of how we got there and whether America was in some way part culpable or not, Russia invaded on the 24th of February last year, exactly 12 months ago tomorrow. What should, I suppose I will ask both sides here, what should, what is the correct response now? To, so what you gentlemen are saying is, more. We should not only support, we should arm and finance and support up to the level we are now, but more still, in which case the, um, the question must be, uh, to what ceiling? Well, I'll tell you exactly what, what we need to do. We need to make sure that when the talk, that we, uh, Ukraine gains a decisive military advantage so that when the talks happen, which will happen eventually to end the war, um, Ukraine is able to talk from position advantage at the oh. diplomatic table, having got one on the battlefield, and they'll want to talk about their territorial integrity, um, they'll want to talk about war crimes, they'll want to talk about reparations, and they'll want to talk about their future security. Now, all of those, I mean, I, I, I can't remember the piece whether you covered the Yugoslav War, I remember the Dayton Peace Agreement. The Dayton Peace Agreement was possible because, in the end, the Serbs had lost the military conflict. We didn't have, you know, Bosnian tanks rolling into Belgrade, but the Serbs were on the back foot. They couldn't get what they wanted, and so they had to talk. And the result was a, a messy but workable piece, but, but fundamentally workable piece. When, what would that point be? That, may may, I, may I? Well, I, I think uh, one of the problems with the conversation that we're having about more, and actually you asked us not to quibble with the motion, but I will very gently. When I, I support providing more, but not like, I, I don't think that fighter jets are necessarily the thing that the Ukrainians need. What they actually need is a lot more artillery. What they need is anti-missile defense systems so that their cities and power networks are not being constantly destroyed. Um, and we've seen in the, in the 12 months, which you bring up, uh, the Ukrainians have been extraordinarily effective uh, in pushing the Russians. If you think about the first few weeks of this conflict, uh, the, the Russian armed forces got within within shooting distance of Kiev. Uh, they got within shooting distance of Kharkiv. They captured Kherson through local treason and so on. None of these cities are currently even remotely threatened by mm. Russian armed forces. Uh, the, the Russians are uh, basically what the Russian armed forces are doing in, in, uh, in the Donbass is smashing their heads against the concrete wall of Ukrainian defenses, losing a lot. And in, in, in order to stop them, what you need is more artillery, anti-missile, anti anti-aircraft defense systems. Oh. And what would that point be where enough, where you feel that the position of strength is reached sufficiently that some, might, some sort of negotiation might happen naturally? Well, no one knows. Does that mean the whole of the pre-2014 borders, including Crimea? What, what is that? Mike, I'm very... Con look, Ukrainians don't like me saying this. I'm very concerned about the idea that Ukraine must recapture Crimea, even though I believe it's Ukrainian territory. But the, the, the geopolitics of a region as such, Russia would not be prepared to give that up at almost any cost. But the, the Donbass provinces? I, again, I don't think anyone particularly cares in Ukraine about the Donbass provinces. They really, really don't. No, the, People the, who live there. President Zelensky will go out and say, you know, we're going to recapture all our territory because his job is to march his country to defend itself and to to raise the spirits of his countrymen and the army and so on. No one actually cares about the Donbass in Ukraine. No one would be willing to sac sacrifice hundreds of thousands of lives to recapture it. What you have to do is to check Russian aggression so that they know there is no point to keep pushing. But if you're, if and, you're, and, if you're happy to surrender the Crimea and the Donbass, yeah. I'm wondering if maybe you should be on this side of the podium because that, there's one that, reason that, that, would, that yeah. would be considered I know. Uh, there's one surrender reason. You could reach an agreement today. There's one, that. Yes, yeah. except... Uh, except <laughs> no, let's continue to Can I just finish this point? Uh, except the one thing that I actually matters is long-term security for Ukraine. And I've made this point from day one, uh, which is Ukraine needs not the guarantees that it already had, by the way, when it was forced by the Western countries to give away its nuclear weapons, which would have protected it from Russia. It needs physical security. And that means membership of NATO or some kind of peacekeeping force on that border in a sort of Korean-style scenario. And that is why Ukraine needs to give Russia a bloody nose so that it can get its long-term security guarantees. It's not bloody enough yet. N apparently not.
But you believe it's not bloody enough, yeah? I believe Putin believes it's not bloody enough, yeah. And okay. he's so, the one that so we have to So you think Russia convince. would not accept those conditions? Based on what? You think Putin would accept mm. membership of NATO for Ukraine no. right now? No, you said you, you said membership of NATO is not necessarily no, no, that's, uh, a that, precondition. That no, you, so, no, you so, said, I mean, a, a, a demilitarized zone no, controlled no, by an, inter, an international it's not demilitarized just territory. territory. Yeah. Would, would, would have the what same I'm effect. Saying, you don't, need, you don't the, need NATO membership. What I'm happen. saying is the territory is less important. What is important is long-term security. Now, what that looks like is either it's one of two things that are completely unacceptable to Russia: either membership of NATO for Ukraine or a Western peacekeeping force on the border with Russia. You think Putin is going to be happy about that? No. And the reason the stalemate that we have I don't now, think that's unreasonable. the reason that we have <clears> the, the continuation of the stalemate we have now is Ukrainians need that long-term security, and Russia is not prepared to give okay. it. And until that changes, that's, that's the conflict will that's go arguable. on. Okay. That's arguable. Um, Ukraine okay, is saying I, I'm going gonna, gonna, gonna to turn to uh, you guys now. So, uh, Thomas and Peter, I have to ask the, the reverse question, which is that when that thing happened 12 months ago tomorrow, when that, that invasion took place, what should mm. the West have done? What, what, what is your counter-proposal? for what a wise course of action would have been if it wasn't arming Ukraine. Yes, but you, for, you forbid discussion of the past, and the, the whole origin of this stupidity lies in the past. I, the, the, there is no excuse, and anybody who s suggests that I'm offering an excuse for the Russian invasion misunderstands wholly what I'm saying. There's no excuse for it. It's a disgusting, lawless, barbaric act, disastrous for Russia, uh, and, and, and almost the act of a madman. So don't try and say that I'm excusing it, but uh, Robert Kagan, one of the leading neoconservative uh, anti-Russian figures in Washington politics, and indeed married to Victoria Newland, who at the State Department has been very active in the, the policy of confronting Russia, uh, has said in Foreign Affairs magazine that beyond doubt Russia was provoked. And I think it is so simple, what should have been a, a, simple, a, a simple matter of fact. What should not have been done is what I said in my opening remarks. What should not have been done is the, the, the steady, uh, relentless provocation of Russia, which which was basically contained in the expansion of NATO ever further east. Now, Russia put up with it. Russia did not lose a war in 1989 or 1990 or 1991. Russia was never defeated. You've had a very war. long go, Constantine, and I've been sitting here with extraordinary patience listening to you. Russia did not was not defeated in a war, and it gave up hundreds of thousands of square miles of territory, not merely in Central Europe, but also in Central Asia, because it was so weak. And I remember being in Moscow during the first great parade of the, of the Russian army through Red Square a few years ago, when my, my good friend, now the, 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 the late uh, Igor Moyshev, stood beside me as we watched all this stuff go past. He said, what do you think of our display of strategic scrap metal? He, like many Russians, knew perfectly well that as Edward and people such as him constantly otherwise claim, that Russia remained extremely militarily weak. And I think if one thing has been proved in the past year, it is that the point made repeatedly by people like me that Russia was being hugely over Estimated mm. as a military power has been forgotten, so and we ha and we now we, we now face a position where it may be that Russia can't be defeated. Actually, nuclear weapon states can be defeated. The United States was defeated in Vietnam, and Britain was defeated in Northern Ireland. We're both nuclear weapon states. And you do, if you can't use them, they're not much use to you in, in in resolving things. Russia could be defeated, and then what? But the point the point here is this: so some of us are going to be asked the, here what, uh, to, to, to try to negotiate on behalf of one side or another. I decline to do so. What I would actually prefer to see is the status quo ante. Uh, Ukraine re restored to its, its sovereignty and integrity as before the putsch, uh, which was a putsch against Yanukovych in, in, in February 2014, and the, uh, the country restored to its unity, and I would then like to see people try to work towards a situation nearly as good as the one we had between 2001 and, to, and, and 2014, during which the actions of the United States created wholly unnecessary tension in a very dangerous area. But so what you can do, more, what you can do about it line, now? You're more hardline than Constantine. I'm much more hardline. I don't, I don't, I don't think so you should, I don't think you should reward us aggression under any, any circumstances. Peter, that was the question. Well, it's yeah. just a tragedy. What, it was a tragedy. It's just that a we tragedy. Had to respond to and it should. Uh, uh, so that happened. Well, we should respond to it. The public opinions of all the free countries in North America and Western Europe should be mobilizing to put an end to this cretinous 
uh, Wolfowitz Doctrine Strategy, pursued by a foreign policy faction in the United States, which is determined to prevent what it fantastically believes will be the return of Russia as a great power. It has been pursued since the 1990s and has led us to this. It's and a crazy means. policy. It's done nothing but good except to arms manufacturers, and it has caused this terrible war, the first war in Europe, in my lifetime, and I am nearly 72. Well, it's caused this war, a policy which is completely unnecessary, has done no good, cannot be explained uh, to civilized people without embarrassment, and has absolutely no benefit for anyone in this room. Okay. And we should, the, 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 peoples well, of, we the peoples of Western Europe and North America should be rising up against it as they rose up against the equal stupidity of the, of, of the Iraq war in 2003. It's unbelievable okay. that we should, we should have allowed our leaders so to get us into we, this mess. We have talked a little bit about the history. We have talked there about the present and the past 12 months. I think we now need to answer the biggest question of all, which is, how might this end? And I'm going to come to Thomas, because he, he was the last person not to speak. And this is a challenge to your side of the argument. How do you propose to end it? Is it surrender? Is it, what is it that you propose? How do we, how do we bring an end to this? I think we know what the conditions for a peace deal would be like. They're the ones that have already been discussed. It's, you know, Crimea remains uh, Russian, some form of autonomy for the Donbass, and some serious security guarantees for Ukraine that don't necessarily have to involve NATO membership. These are the conditions around which, you know, from what we know, Ukraine and Russia had come close to an agreement repeatedly over the past year. So we know that these are going to be the end conditions of an agreement. And the notion that we should, you know, continue the destruction a bit more, continue the, 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 you know, the, the, the loss of life for, for just a bit longer, because that will give us a bit of an upper hand in reaching an agreement that will look very much like the same agreement that we could have reached a year ago, I find extremely uh, callous, uh, frankly. And that excludes the risk of a serious NATO-Russia escalation. Everyone's pretending that that's not a real risk, you know? But, that, you know, the RAND Corporation, the most important American <coughs> security think tank, ultra hawkish, just put out a report saying a prolonged conflict is extremely dangerous because it, 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 incre it obviously increases exponentially the risk of this getting out of hand. And it does increase the risk of potentially a nuclear conflict. I mean, the RAND Corporation, they're not peaceniks. And they're saying it's not in the US and in the West's interest to continue down this road because it is, it is an extremely dangerous road. And we're just simply pretending so that, that's, that go that's never going to happen. You'd go unilaterally to Putin and say, we want to talk. This is our proposed deal. And it, what do you say to everyone who says you're giving too much away? He is a you know, judo player. He wants to see strength and all of that. Do you think that's just all nonsense? Do you, do you not think there's any risk that, that if the West suddenly says, OK, let's talk, you can have the Donbass and Crimea, just please stop, he doesn't get I think there's a much, by that. I think think there's a much greater risk in continuing the war in the hope of gaining a small upper hand in an agreement that will very much look like the one that I've just described. Everyone knows that. That's what I find ludicrous about this whole you discussion. Jump in, may I make a very quick observation, mm -hmm. which is neither, neither of, of uh, our esteemed opposition have answered the question of what should be done. And Thomas says... I have. I just, yes. I just, I just, no, I, I, I just answered Peter it. Peter absolutely answered. did not answer it at I did. All. I said the peoples of, the West, of, of, of Western Europe and North America should combine uh, to, pr to press their democratically elected leaders to end this foolish policy. How? How? By, by the forces which are available in a law-governed democratic which country, or public, well, no, no. What, or public, what public opinion end? and organization. How would you end the war? That's how I would do it. How, how would I end the war? I would, I would put, put, put pressure on the United States and Russia, who are the principal participants, to make peace. How? But, that, but by, as I say, particularly, it, 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 it's my belief, you, you keep asking. But how do they make Thank peace? Thank you for keeping asking, because I can, I can expand on it. In the United States, where support for this war is already diminishing in, 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 the, in the American public, with good reason, in the United States, once it becomes clear that the people are not interested in continuing it, then the politicians in Washington, D.C. Will, will also lose, lose interest, and so will the White House. And do what? And do when the, the when the, when, once the Americans have ceased, have ceased to believe that there is any point in, in domestic policy in pursuing this war, the war will end. The war is kept going by fun, fundamentally. By, mean, by, well, by, by, by the method by which the Vietnam War was ended. Sorry. I'm sorry you're so young, but it is possible for people <laughs> in okay. democratic countries to organize against wars and bring them you to an end. My it has yes. happened okay. in so, our lifetime. So, so, I, I've got a, a few. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm very I'm very glad you mentioned the Kagan piece. I do recommend reading it from beginning to end. Yeah, I do. When he says provoked, he, what he f f highlights as provocative, indeed intolerable for Russia, was that Ukraine was becoming a success. 
Mm -hmm. That's the big problem for Putin, to have a large, orthodox, Slavic country on his doorstep, which is moving towards the rule of law and democracy. That is intolerable for Putin. That is the ultimate provocation that the Ukrainians have made, is they dared to want what we've got here. And so we have a choice about that. We either say, sorry, you live in a bad neighbourhood, suck it up, or we say, we're going to help you. And that's very, very, very binary. Um, on the question of, of how, I, I, the, how, the, it ends. how it ends, the, one of the key things here has been the experience of people under Russian occupation. When you see what happens mm. to people under Russian occupation as a Ukrainian, you are furious, miserable, and um, utterly dismayed because we see the forced abduction of children, the rapes, the murder, all the sort of things that the Soviets did in, when they conquered Eastern Europe mm. uh, or so liberated it in, in 40, 40, 44 to 45. And it's all happening again. The territory that Russia has conquered in addition to, what is, to, to the Donbass and, and Crimea is greater than the entire population of the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. The Ukrainians living under Russian rule, experiencing all these horrors, are greater than the population um, of Estonia or Latvia or, or, or Lithuania. So this is really visceral for them, and it's worth no, just no. No, 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 noting why they are proportionately giving more than any other country in the world to Ukraine. One percent of Estonia's GDP has gone to Ukraine. That's not because they're part of the American war machine. Mm -hmm. That's because they say, we remember this. This happened to us only decades ago. It's happening to you right now. So the problem with so the you idea... you think it's likely that Russia invades Estonia and Finland and if know, Russia, Western if, European if Russia countries get, next? Absolutely. If That's Russia ludicrous. Get, if Russia get, well, it doesn't seem very ludicrous if you live there because <laughs> Russia has rehearsed this already. I refer you back to 2009. Did you follow the Zapad 09 um, military exercises, they rehearsed the invasion and occupation of the Baltic states. Yes, but Edward, if you'll excuse me, NATO holds exercises in, in Estonia in which rocket firing brigades are moved up to the Estonian border within reach of, of, of St. Petersburg, a city which within, with, which within Russian living memory has been subject to a, a lengthy starvation siege. It's not one-sided. I'm, I'm not a defender of Russia in these events. Absolutely not. I think it's behaved atrociously. But, but it is absurd to picture one side as Gandalf and the other side as Sauron the Dark Lord. Both sides have done dreadful things, continue to do them. Look at the recent United Nations report on treatment of prisoners of war. It condemns both sides. Of course it does. If you don't like, if you don't like atrocities, don't start wars. But if you have wars, both sides will commit them. It's not an argument, and it, nor is it an argument that, 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 to, to say that, that Russia has behaved in that way in, on, on one side of the Estonian border if you if you recognize as you must that nato has behaved in the other way no oh, i don't we, if you can, can, have to can, answer that can, can we can we, can we just, the, the, just the, for the a moment ima here, imagine we're just we're talking it's, about the end we're, well, we, we're, we're trying to talk about the end but they want they don't want to know we're trying and this is how it ends it ends i'll tell you exactly let's get back to that i'll tell you if putin is able to walk away with from this with something that he can say to his people are the spoils of victory that's legitimized his war machine and his lie machine and we will be in an incomparably worse place as a result. But you disagree with Constantine, then, that there will be some territorial concession at the end? That's up for the Ukrainians. To, I mean, I, I refer you back to the Dayton Agreement. Nobody got exactly what they wanted, but we got something workable at the end. But what so I, you I, won't I, say. So when does the negotiation oh, start? Then? Well, as I said, I said, as I said 50 uh, minutes ago, it starts once Russia realises that they can't get what they want militarily. And they're not they. a long time. Well, the sooner we get on with it, the sooner that point will come. And what annoys me about this is we sit here and dither and draw red lines and then move them and then step over them. And every day we do this, Ukrainians are paying with their blood and their tears for our indecision. May I ask a question? May, may I ask a question? Con you can in a moment. Constantine, you're, you're coming next. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, and I, I agree with, with what Edward just said. And I think the, the one thing that, again, I, I, I'm not attempting to make this personal. We've had a very heated conversation. It's not an attack on Thomas or on Peter. But my experience Excuse continuing my whenever I talk about this uh, with people is that the people who who, who quote-unquote want peace, never explain the mechanism by which that peace will be achieved. They say, we must put pressure on the U.S. government. And I say, fine, let's put pressure on the U.S. government. To do what? What is it that you expect them to do? You can, if you want peace, uh, right now, take away all support from the Ukrainians and you will achieve peace very quickly. By well, the slaughter of the Ukrainians. How are you going to achieve peace? Well, I've made this point. Just let me ask you. If Ukraine stops, if Russia stops fighting, 
there's no more war. Yeah. If Ukraine stops fighting, there's no more Ukraine. Of course. But my point is... But Ukraine could stop uh, fighting uh, tonight and the Americans would continue to keep the war going. The, 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 this is a... 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 Leon, 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 Leon Panetta, what I'm talking about, Leon Panetta... He's not going to fight Ukraine, is he? Leon Panetta, who... Leon Panetta, who was U.S. Defense Secretary, who was White House Chief of Staff and Head of the CIA, has said this is a proxy war between the United States and Russia. Everybody who knows that. the Ukrainians stop, how will the Americans keep fighting? If the Ukrainians lose heart and want to stop fighting, the Americans would not allow them. Well, I, 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 I'm not seriously maintaining that. They didn't say That's that. That's what you just said. I mean, I, it's, 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 this, this is, this, we're, it, we're back into the straw man territory, which Constantine said. No, we're just quoting you. But you I was, literally no, you're just not quoting it. me. You're okay. misquoting you okay. okay. me. You're okay. misquoting me. But the, the point I was going to ask <laughs> Edward was this. He said that, that what was required was a decisive military advantage. Now, since he won't say what sort of settlement he would accept, uh, I think it's fair to, for him to, to explain what he believes a decisive I'm military you. advantage yes. for the, let's, Ukra let's the American let's Ukrainian let's side would look like. Okay, so well, that's, a, I think that's I'll a tell very you exactly. fair question. I'll tell you exactly. What is the moment where we say, okay, we're now on the upper hand, and it can't be that Vladimir Putin suddenly comes begging for peace, because that's quite an unlikely scenario. No, I'm, I'm delighted, delighted to what answer is that. that the most Jesus vulnerable then. part in the Russian military machine is logistics, the enormous quantities of ammunition, spare parts, fuel... Um, all the other things that modern armies run on. Um, if Ukraine has an advantage in long-range precision strikes, which it's gaining, and I would very strongly urge the United States to give the attackers as well as the, as the HIMARS, then the Russian war machine becomes unsustainable. It becomes impossible for them to um, attack, and it becomes increasingly difficult for them to defend because their troops run out of the food, fuel, munitions. And you're not and worried really... about escalation. Well, let me kind of just un fin finish the question. The other point that will happen is that Crimea becomes unsustainable. Um, Crimea is the great trophy of the Putin foreign policy, and if Russians don't want to live in Crimea, maybe because the bridge is un under attack or the land bridge is under attack, then you have got the point where you can say to the Russians, now, now you need to talk, because what the, the, the great spectre that haunts the Russia, the great fear, is of 1917 all over again of the disintegration of the Russian army. And as morale um, drops, and we're already seeing this, mm -hmm. mutiny, looting, that's not looting of Ukrainians, that's allowed, looting of their own side, surrender and desertion, those four things are all increasing. We're seeing already the, I would say, the, the next Russian civil war may have already started with the private military companies attacking each other mm. on the battlefield, stealing munitions and uniforms mm -hmm. and weapons from each other because central power is weakening. So as the spectre of 1917 grows, the imperative for a political solution for Putin or whoever comes after Thomas, him, and I think that may come sooner than we want, also increases. OK, now, I'm, I'm going to come to, to Thomas next, yeah. because you haven't had much of a chance recently. This is a really think, good challenge to your argument, isn't it? Because actually things have been going better than expected for the West, and if Ed and Constantine are right, that actually momentum can carry on building and that the Russian side starts to fall apart, maybe they're right. Maybe there is a moment where Putin suddenly gets more interested in negotiation and peace can happen that way. Well, first of all, this whole argument is premised on the idea that Russia would not ag accept an agreement more or less along the lines that we've discussed right now, even though very, you know, well-informed people have told us that over the past year they have come close to an agreement that was more or less based along these lines. We know from the former, you know, Israeli prime minister, he said so. He said we were very close to an agreement along these lines. <laughs> so so you, so you just he made that up. I mean, we, we heard it from Turkey. NATO membership so for in Ukraine? The par, in the past. NATO no, membership for no, Ukraine? No, that doesn't have to... So what, so kind of what kind of security are you providing to Ukraine under your proposal? You mentioned some form of international force. You think uh, Vladimir Putin the right now You're would accept... UN peacekeepers in Ukraine. I, I, I don't see that he said that that's a red line. I see you I see Ukraine say no, we're going to retake Crimea. The I see Ukraine say no, we're going to retake the Donbass. They're the ones that are, that are making completely unreasonable requests. Mm. Okay, the, okay. Not the, Russia. The, the entire moment. rationale of Putin's invasion is to push the West from Russia's borders. Do you really think that he would accept UN peacekeepers in the Donbass? Chinese peacekeepers? <laughs> can, can I just ask the other side? Have you read Putin's démarche to NATO from December 2021? Are you familiar with what Putin issued as his, his, his demand to NATO in, in 2021, December? What was this another? I'm, I'm just asking either, either of you, did you read? This was the Russian demand to, to NATO in December 2021. Tell us what was in it. He said, I want the withdrawal 
of all NATO forces from Eastern Europe. That will be the end of NATO. Mm -hmm. He's going back to what we originally did in 1997 when we said you can join NATO but you can't have, we're not going to put any forces well, there. I think we can agree that the conditions have changed for Russia as well. So. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I, sorry, sorry, but I mean, this is the whole point. If you don't accept, it's not just about Ukraine. This is about the future of, it's about the future security of Europe. And Konstantin is absolutely right. You can't say to Ukraine, um, negotiate on territory and then rely on a signature. We tried that in 1994. Mm -hmm. The Budapest Memorandum was signed by Russia and Britain and France and America, the nuclear powers. Mm. Um, and, and there was no footnote in the Budapest Memorandum that said this does not apply if you have... So what's going to be NATO done? nuclear weapons on the Russian border what is, in Ukraine? Is that your solution? I mean, what? No. Well, I'm, what, what, is the, what is the solution? I, 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 I'll tell you exactly what mm. I want. I want Ukraine in NATO. And if Ukraine had been yeah. allowed to join NATO, um, do you think 15 years ago, Putin would accept we would that? not have this war now. So he wouldn't do you accept think, that do you think, now. Do you think Maybe it would have happened then. I this, think it would have happened earlier, yes. Do you think at this future moment <clears> that you're talking about, weakened by some military campaign, Vladimir Putin or his replacement, would accept NATO membership I think for Ukraine? I think the result of this war in the end for Russia will probably the fall of the Putin regime to be some kind of Brest-Litovsk, a really, really big um, strategic setback for them. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I... Are you I, worried about what might come after that? I'm much more worried. Actually, I mean, we've talked about the war. I'm really worried about post-Putin Russia. Mm -hmm. And there's basically two options. One is, um, any, anyone here speak Russian? Hands up, any Russian speakers? Okay, so smuta, smuta, the, the, the idea of a time of trouble. I think Russia's heading for a new smuta. And that's going to be very, oh, very sorry. tricky. The West is going to hate it because of lo oh. Sorry? Mm. No, I just wondered if I could have a go. Yes, yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay. Have a go. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank, so, thank you. What I, we, we are, we are the whole into, go ahead. ladies and gentlemen, we are into the final um, 10 to 12 minutes of this discussion. So what I'm going to ask uh, Peter you to do is to do your best to sum up your thoughts and do your best rebuttal of what you've heard, but maybe leave us with a bit of a a plan or a bit of a sense of no, uh, what might come next. I'll do, I'll, do, I'll do what I can, but I think it's, it's futile having four people on a platform in, 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 a, in, a, in a room in London trying to, to, to negotiate an enormously complicated deal which is best left to diplomats, and we will not come to anything. What I'm just struck by the fact that, that Edward's description of a decisive military advantage is actually plainly a Russian defeat. And you were just asked uh, what, whether you were worried about the consequences of that. And if, uh, and if you think, I mean, do you think uh, that if there's a Russian defeat that uh, Vladimir Putin will be replaced by somebody nicer? No, do you think it will be from one of, your, what you think be one of your liberal Democrats? No, much worse. Much exactly. Worse. So, so this will have been the fundamental achievement of all this effort, will have been the replacement of Vladimir Putin, that sinister tyrant, with somebody worse, somebody more unpredictable in a country that's more desperate. I cannot, for the life of me, see how this could be rated as a major achievement of Western diplomacy or politics. And I keep saying it. What has been the purpose? I go back to what George Kennan, who's, who's cleverer than anybody in this room, uh, prophetically said all those years ago. Why are we doing this? Why are we making this grave mistake? And having made it and seen the, the, the horrors in piles of corpses and destroyed cities, having seen the horrors which it results in, why are we persisting in it? It, it, it is perfectly possible. I don't know why Constantine is so derisive about the idea that the peoples of free countries should, should lobby and, and press their governments That's to bring an end to stupid policies. It's our duty as human beings to do this for, the, for, for, for our own sake and for the sake of those who come after us. Okay. We have no higher duty than to bring this idiocy to an end. And if the end of it is a, is a, is a possibly rather squalid uh, deal, which none of us particularly likes, then remember that almost all of us spent our lives in the shadow of the most squalid appeasement deal in the history of the human race, made at Yalta between Winston Churchill, Franklin Roosevelt, and Stalin, which secured the peace and prosperity, prosperity of Western Europe for many years. Squalor may sometimes be necessary, and jaw jaw is better than war war. And this enthusiasm for war, which for some reason persists in this country, really does need to be curbed. Because when it comes home to you, when you see what a human head looks like, when a bullet has passed through it, as I did that January night in, in, in 1991 in Vilnius, then your view of it will change. You will be less sanguine about the idea of having more war and longer war and deeper war and more weapons. Thank and I you. wish you would. Thank you, Peter. That's all right. I say that. This is your concluding um, statement. Yes, I, I mean, I, 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 I've, I've covered uh, two wars, and I think that war is uh, the most grotesque and horrible thing 
you can imagine happening to people you love. And sometimes, and nobody goes into, a, on, on, I think, would, would, would choose a war if they had the choice. But that's not the point here. The point here is that we are dealing with an imperialist power that is trying to exert, um, it's fighting an old-fashioned colonial war to re-establish its linguistic, cultural, ethnic, and fundamentally um, political hegemony over one of its former colonies. This is as, as a bit like if Britain invaded Ireland or France invaded Algeria. That's what it's fundamentally about. And until Russia stops being an empire, we've got a problem. The best defence we have against Russia's um, imperialism is NATO. I'm glad we've got it. It's not perfect. I wish we'd done things differently. But in the end, just ask yourself, if you were a Ukrainian sitting there in the dark and cold, worried about airstrikes with your male relatives at the front, would you be saying, this is ridiculous, we should talk, let's give things up, we never want to be in NATO, we, never want, we don't want security, we don't want anything, just let us live? Or would you say, please, Western friends, send us the weapons we need so that we can win this? Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thomas Batson, your concluding thoughts. Well, I think there's there's a an actor that you know has been completely absent from the discussion, and that's Western European citizens. They're just expected to be spectators on the sideline of a war that's happening on their borders. Um, even though we know that there's low and rapidly declining support for this war in a number of countries, in my country, for example, a majority of people don't support our. Um, you know, the Italian government sending weapons to Ukraine, but it does it nonetheless. So, you know, the Western European citizens are completely uh, you know, excluded from the debate, excluded from the discussion, even though they are also suffering the consequences of this. And they have every right to demand that their leaders also worry about their economic security, which they're not guaranteeing by, you know, plunging them into a devastating energy crisis. They have every right to demand that their leaders offer them actual physical security, which they're not getting by getting pushed in a, what is turning into, you know, an actual direct confrontation with Russia. I think Western European citizens have every right to be terrified mm. by this prospect, and I think their voices should be heard as well. Okay, thank you, mm. Thomas. Bravo. Final statement, Constantine Kissin. Well, let me Conclude end on, on a conciliatory note in, in saying that I agree with almost everything Peter said in his concluding mm. statement. I think war is terrible. And when I speak to my 96-year-old grandmother who lives in the south of Ukraine, 100 kilometers from the front, uh, who lived through the Nazi occupation as a girl, who is now terrified, uh, who's uh, seeing missiles being dropped in her city, the notion that uh, to support Ukraine in defending itself is uh, to be pro-war uh, is uh, insulting to me uh, personally. And I think it's completely untrue. Uh, we are supporting a country that has become a victim of foreign aggression. We're allowing them to defend themselves. We're allowing them to retain their sovereignty. We're allowing them uh, to determine the fate uh, of their own country by themselves. Uh, and as long as uh, we continue to do that, I've made the point here. I don't think the constructive ideas about how to end this conflict are coming from its critics. Uh, I think we've made a very good case for how that war ends. I'm less... Um, I'm less uh, aggressive, I suppose, in, in my approach to how this war would end, because I think the collapse of uh, the Putin regime or some kind of Brest-Litovsk would be very, very bad for the world. And I think the, the this is why I don't believe we should pursue a defeat Russia by any means sort of strategy at all. But well, as I said before, what we need to do is allow the Ukrainians to stand up for their country to get a good outcome, and the good outcome must mean that they have permanent, long-term security so that this never, ever happens again and I remind people <laughs> that what happened in 2014 and all the weapons that Thomas mentioned being poured into Ukraine was a response. It was a response to the Russian invasion of Crimea and annexation of Crimea and the funding of breakaway, a very small percentage, by the way, of, uh, of paramilitaries and uh, extremists in the east of Ukraine to start that conflict there, supported by Russian troops and weapons. Uh, and so uh, I think in order to end the war, uh, we have to continue uh, to allow Ukraine to stand up for itself. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to our four speakers. Um, we stayed just about on the right side of civility, um, just during that, and yes, 
there are occasionally bad tempers and people feel very strongly about it, but it surely is better to discuss it, even if it's hard to yeah. prevent it becoming an argument, than skip the discussion and not have it. So thank you for being part of it. And with that in mind, I'm going to ask you to vote once again. And we will see, and let, let, let me just restate that it is our strong opinion that good, well-informed, intelligent people can come to differing views on this question, so there is no judgment in either direction. Do please either raise your hand or, if you are online, take part in the online poll. Say, if the West should give more military support to Ukraine, please raise your hand in favour. I'm making around 30, 31 there. Um, the one I think, I did, I, think <laughs> I did 29 at the start. Um, and now let's see if you are against the motion and that the West should not be sending more military support. We make that 20, either 23 or 24. One to be right. fair, I, I'm not confident that my counting was sufficiently <laughs> accurate. I'm not that sure that a large number of people have necessarily changed. Perhaps there's been what we call churn. Did you, did you want to, do, did you, did you want to ask for abstention? A lot of people have changed their minds under the surface. Do we have a vote online? So where should give more military support? Four. I think the four position has increased in the online audience from about 37% to 46%. So you won some people over there, uh, Constantine and Edward. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. The bar is open. If you've been tuning in online, thank you to you, too. We will be doing many more of these. And come back. Um, and uh, see you next time.